everyone welcome once again to my channel uh, dr Quesero tv and to my show ask the cheese doctor today we are giving the program number 20 and we've been working we've been talking through the weeks the, the past two weeks we've been talking about how to make a safe cheese and we, we i've been talking about how to implement a food con control plan for cheese making which is very important when you make cheese you have to implement um you have to put in practice several steps that you have to consider when you made the cheese the, uh, this program is for the english speakers <coughs> i have my program in spanish as well at 9 30 i'm uh, sorry at 10 o'clock and uh, in this program you can ask anything about cheese making and and after the i, I normally i usually um have a small presentation so you guys can learn of the knowledge that i that i give and then um you can ask anything about cheese making if you have problems in your processes in your if your cheese doesn't curl or doesn't stretch and anything you can you can ask whatever you want and um i also answer the questions from my audience and i have heaps here that i have uh, that i'm going to answer uh, straight away um but first let's go with the presentation we all are busy uh, this this program is being transmitted in instagram facebook and youtube okay so if if you can see it for any reason and you can always watch it after because it's going to be recorded and it's going to be uploaded to the channel okay okay let's go with the presentation today we're going to speak about the last part of how to make a good cheese okay a safe food safe cheese um let's go with the presentation here ah, let me share the screen first uh, i'm always struggling with this platform <laughs> okay here we are okie dokie here we are. Let's go with the screen. Okay. Now, uh, when we make cheese, when we make cheese, I've been talking about safety food during the last two weeks. When we make cheese, especially if we sell the cheese, um, however, it also applies to our family if we are making a cheese the cheese that our family or our clients are consuming have to be safe they have to be free of diseases otherwise they're going to get sick and in the worst case scenario they might die so um ma, when we make cheese you have to put in practice several steps that will guarantee that our process is safe and especially if we use and different type of milk if we are using for example raw milk that is not pasteurized we have to make the milk safe for the for the consumer and also for in, in, in addition to the consumer it has to be safe for us if we are going to consume the, the cheese as well so and we have to have these systems in place in general terms these systems um i've been talking about the protocols <coughs> that we have to follow in general terms, we have to follow several some protocols. All of them are different, depend depending of the type of cheese that we make, and also depending of the type of milk that we use. Uh, and, and and we have to consider issues such as the um, the environment, the safety of our personal, our our safety as well. We have to consider the the quality of the milk. Uh, we also have to consider the um, um, the um, how to avoid cross contamination we have to um, establish protocols that will guarantee that the way we handle the the system or the, we handle our equipment or the way we handle the cheese is a guarantee that our system works for that when we made when we made the cheese we have to um each we um depending on the type of cheese that we make we have to establish like some and uh, the steps of the 
of the process. Each step is an obstacle. Some of them are more important than others. So um, when we, uh, in cheese making, in general terms, and, we, I'm gonna, and we're gonna speak about this in, 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 in a minute. And when we make cheese, we have to overcome these obstacles and, and pass to the next step. The next step will become another obstacle and we have to overcome it as well and so on until we finish the process and get the product that is safe. Um, and this is what I want to talk about you. Okay. For example, in cheese making, in cheese making, we have to control, we have a process depending on the type of cheese that we make. In general terms, if we make, for example, a fresh cheese, which is something very straightforward. Um, if we make a fresh cheese, we have to um, have several steps. These steps are followed by the recipe. If we are making fresh cheese, you have to follow a recipe. Steps one, all this, each step of the process is an obstacle that we have to overcome, okay? For example, uh, uh, and one thing, and this obstacle starts since we receive the milk. Even when we open the, the, our kitchen, we have to, obstacles there that we have to overcome. Um, to put an example, if I'm going to make cheese at home, I have to make sure there is a hazard. Which is the hazard? Cross-contamination. Because we're making cheese at home, we're using our kitchen to make food. And the kitchen might be contaminated with the food or with the, the stuff that we use to make our own food. So we have to, if we're gonna make cheese, we have to, and if we have to make cheese for sale, we have to guarantee that our kitchen is uh, sanitized. What, should, what you have to do, we have to sanitize the kitchen first. Before we even start making cheese, we have to sanitize everything. We have to sanitize the, the, the floor, we have to sanitize all the top of the kitchen, our gear, our knife, um, and we have to follow a protocol. What protocol to follow? It will depend on the type of, 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 of the environment or, or, or if, the, if, the, if your kitchen is big or small. Maybe you can use chlorine solution or maybe you can use an chemical. I mean, the person who designed the system is the one who's going to choose which chemical is going to use. And then you, once you, after your, your kitchen is sanitized, now you overcome this obstacle. So now you have another obstacle, which is the milk. When the milk comes, okay, um, you have another obstacle. This milk, is it safe? Maybe the milk is it pasteurized. We have to guarantee that the milk that we are using is safe. Um, and let's put two scenarios. The first scenario, the first case scenario, our milk is pasteurized. Okay, if our milk is pasteurized, we don't have an obstacle. We have another obstacle that maybe my milk is too hot. It came hot from the, from the supplier. The milk has to come a minimum four degrees. Okay, this is what the standard says. Oh, this is what our system said because we designed it this way. And the milk came at four degrees. Okay, everything is fine. We're going to heat the milk or put the starter culture. But in the in the, the other work, the other case scenario is that our milk is raw, it's not pasteurized. So we have an obstacle over there. And in addition to that, the milk came hot. So we have to, what we have to do is the if the milk came hot at let's say 30 degrees and this milk is gonna be used to make cheese. This milk for sure has pathogens that we need to kill. How we kill them? We have to pasteurize the milk. So, and then if we pasteurize the milk, we overcome this um, obstacle and we are guaranteeing, guaranteeing here that our milk, uh, the quality of our milk is good. So we go to the next step, which is the starter culture. Okay, we're gonna 
And then now we have another obstacle. Is our starter culture good enough? Is it contaminated? Or is it old? Or is it um, it's been using for a while? And maybe it, it's been cross-contaminated because we, we use a spoon every time we use the same spoon. Is our spoon sterilized when we use the, 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 the culture to put into the milk? So we have obstacles that we have to overcome, and so on, and so on. And another one is the temperature. If we want to measure the temperature, okay, we want to measure the temperature. What is the recipe? My cheese recipe says that I have to heat the milk at 36 degrees, to put an example. Ah, okay, I'm going to measure with my thermometer. How do I know? Okay, I have the thermometer. Do I have it? First, do I have a thermometer? I have an obstacle over there. Do I have a thermometer? Yes, I do have a thermometer. Okay, so I'm putting, I'm, I'm chucking the, um, the thermometer into the milk. Is the temperature that the thermometer is giving me, the, the, the reading of the thermometer is accurate, is reliable? I don't know. So I have to calibrate my thermometer. Okay. Now, if I calibrate it, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that my, my reading is going to be accurate and going to be reliable. So I overcome the, the process. Now I have to, I start the process and put the culture and the milk start to acidify the, 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 um, the curd. Okay, um, now I'm going to check the pH. Same process. Is my pH meter reliable? The reading that I have, that I'm having is reliable. Is the one that is the, the instrument is giving me? This is the true factor. I don't know. So how do I know? I have to calibrate my pH meter and so on. My, the salt content. Is my, my, my supplier of salt is reliable? Where did it come from? Come from China. Ooh, come from China. Uh, maybe my salt come from China. OK. Does the supplier have a certificate that have done all the tests and it's it doesn't have listeria, it doesn't have allergens or something like that? OK, yes, um, I have it. Oh, no, I don't have it. So if I don't have it, I can use the supplier. I have to change the supplier. And then when I go to the supply, I'll ask him, hey, do you have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy salt, salt from you. Do you have all your consents and stuff? And do you have a certification of your product? Yes, I do have it. Okay, boom, give it to me. So you have, you, and you have to keep this record. And you have, to, the thing is that you have, each step, you have to um, make a record of each step and you have to put it in black and white. Okay, and file it in your system. And the idea is that if something happened with your problem, let's say that because problems come every day. So if something happened to your, pro to your product and you have a complaint for a client or you have a complaint for a family, from a family, a family member, and you tell you, Dietrich, I, or whatever, I ate your cheese and I got sick, I got diarrhea. So something's wrong with your cheese. So you have to, if you follow this system, if you follow these steps, you will be able to trace what happened to your product. Okay? And, and you will go, you, you will be able to go backwards on the on the step of the process, and then you will find your problem, your problem. Okay. Also, for example, if you are um, producing the product, you have to be able to trace who did you give your product to. If you made 10 kilos of a cheese, you need to know who ate your cheese, what people ate it. I mean, in average terms, okay? Um, I sold to the factory one, I, I, I sold it to family of, or I'll give it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be sold, you, have to, you can gift it. I gift it to family member number one, family member number two, five, six, seven. So I know who has my cheese, okay? In this way, if something happened, you know what to do. Okay. Okay. Um, when you make this process, you have to, uh, as I said, you have to write everything. And then you have to guarantee that your system works. And how do we do that? Okay. The best way to know if your system works is that you have to make tests. You have to go to the lab. You have to take samples from your cheese, cheese making process, take samples, send it to the lab. 
if you are making cheese as a commercial in as a commercial in a commercial way if you're making cheese for your friends you don't have, you don't need to comply with that because you're doing it as a hobby and or for yourself but if you're going to start going serious in this business and you want to sell cheese you have to do this okay you have to prove that your system works and to to do it you can test that your cheese meets the required limits okay each process as i said each process each step of the process have um a value that you need to comply with to put an example if i'm going to make fresh cheese the ph of my curd before i drain the whey has to be 6.1 to put an example if i i i, I drain the whey at 5.6 Sorry, um, uh, 6.9 or 6.8 in instead of 6.1, your curd is going to be more alkaline than expected, and therefore you might have a problem because the high pH doesn't kill the bacteria. And you have to comply if, you, if, if, if your cheese making process states that you have to weigh off or drain the whey at certain number of pH, you have to comply with it and make a register. Okay, the same with the salt content, moisture, and water activity. Okay, if you if you are doing the things as expected and you are complying with your pH, your level of salt, your moisture content, and your the the the, 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 the quality of your culture, the quality of your milk, and you are complying with all the process, and for any reason. Your system, when you because you have to send, as I said, samples to the lab to prove that your system is working, and you have to do it periodically. You have to do it every month. So if, if you um, um, your system for any reason, when you made a test, you test from the lab, come back with um, any value above this, this the the the, the, the standards from the country. To put an example, if your level of E. coli is higher than the standard established by the country, you have a problem, and then you have to redesign your system and increase the pH level, or even maybe you have to pasteur, pasteurize again. If you pasteurize your milk, and you um, if your milk comes pasteurized and you have a certification from the supplier that your milk is certified and it's safe, your system your milk is getting contaminated during the process so you have to change your protocols to make um, your, your your process safer so you in this way you can comply with the when you when you make the cheese again you have to redesign your process when that there in a way that when you go when you make the cheese again you will you can be able to have reliable result compliant results okay if your system and you have to go in this loop until your cheese is safe and comply with the limits okay um another and if your cheese there is a test called streptococcus aureus which is a um it's a, it's a mold it's a, it's a yes or a mold that is on the air the spores that are on the air and you have to comply with a certain level of streptococcus aureus if you are above this level you have to redesign your process you have to send it maybe because this process happens when the when your factory or your house or your kitchen is not very clean so you have to change your cleaning protocol change products and do it in a different way so you can comply once you comply you can carry on okay when you use pasteurized or termicized milk, termicized milk is a milk, as I said before, that you heat at 60 degrees, not 63. The minimum temperature for pasteurization is 63 degrees. And um, termicized milk is this milk that you heat at 60 degrees, three degrees less, for five or six seconds. And, and this milk is not fully pasteurized, as it needs to comply with certain standards for, for so for pasteurized or term or term termized milk different batches of each type of cheese must be verified or tested and that it complies with the parameters of e coli listeria streptococcus aureus and salmonella okay 
These, these four are the main um, bacteria that affect the cheese making process. So you have to always, when you make cheese, you have to do these four tests. Okay? For each batch, um, they cost more or less three hundred dollars in New Zealand. Okay, this batch. The, of course, you don't have to make a batch. You don't have to make tests of every batch. You make if you make, for example, if you make you in the during the month, you make fifty batches. You can try five batches, ten percent, and if you have. If you have, I mean, this this um, number of lab tests will be in your system dependent of, de depending on the number of batches that you make during the month. And it has to be established and agree with your verifier. Your verifier is the person that verifies from the government, that verifies that your system is working. And you have to give in all the data. Okay, so if, if, you, if your system works, you file it, boom. And then when the when this person comes to verify your company that you are complying with the system and stuff, they will you you will show them I have this process is very it's been verified I have I have I haven't had any issues so no problem okay in this way you can you're proving that your system is working okay for cheeses made with raw milk it's more complicated okay and you can if you are using raw milk. You cannot make fresh cheeses. You cannot make mozzarella or pasta, uh, pasta filata cheese. If you're using raw milk, um, you have to you you have to ripen your cheeses for minimum two months, two months and one day, because two months is not enough either. You have to ripen it for more than two months. Okay, so um, sorry. If you are making mozzarella. You have to compulsorily make uh, pasteurize your milk. If you not pasteurize your milk and you're making the mozzarella, because you uh, some people say that the heat kills the bacteria, no, that's not true. Okay, it kill the heat when you when you uh, when you hit the curd, the heat will kill part of the bacteria, part of it. But into the curd to to pasteurize it, the temperature of the curd should be minimum. 70 degrees three of two per three three seconds when you are heating the curd in some areas of your curd you might get this temperature but in some areas you, you're not going to get it so the pasteurization for due to heating is not going to be uh, even it's going to be odd so and you have to um you have to um Pasteurize the milk before you make it, the, this type of cheeses. Okay, in this way you are guaranteeing that your product is safe. Okay, as I said before, you must keep a record of your process and checks. Every do everything that you do, you have to record it. If you are if you have in your freezer and you have your cheese store over there, you have to check the temperature of your freezer every week. Not every day, but you can check it every week for nightly. You can you have to check it and you have to um, do it periodically and you have to prove that you're doing it. How? Make a record. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> if any batch does not meet the limits that you that you have designed, you must start you must start a verification process again. You must if 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 you if you make a batch and it doesn't comply, something is wrong. So you have to start. Verifying what happened, you have to start to investigate what went wrong, what uh, what went wrong with this batch, and you have to. And if you already deliver it, you have to call your client. Hey, I have E. coli in this batch, so don't eat the cheese. Bring it back, please, or dump it because um, your client might get sick. And then you will, if you don't say, if you don't do that. Several things could happen. The first one, that they might die or might get sick. And second one is a consequence of that, which you might get a fine. You might, your company might, be, might get closed. You could go to jail if they die. Because it's a crime. And um, the most important thing your 
your um, reputation is going to go to hell. So you have to comply with this process because it will, you, it will give you peace of mind when you make the cheese, okay? I've been making cheese for eight years. Uh, he, more or less seven, eight years. And I never have had um, a complaint from clients at all because I always follow my protocol. When you make the cheese, you have to make the cheese the same way all the time. You have to, because if you do it this way, making cheese, following a system, avoid improvisation. You, you don't improvise. And when we improvise is when we make mistakes. So if you don't improvise, if you do this all, all the time the same, your product is going to be safe. Because you are, before, to put an example, if I am making cheese, and my, someone called me on my cell phone, and I grab my cell phone. Hi, how are you? I grab it. I finish my call. I have cross contamination in my hand. I have to soak my hands into the chlorine solution for one minute. Take it out. In this way, my hands are not con not contaminated. I can carry on with the process. I can carry on handling anything. If I go like this. For example, my hands are cross-contaminated. I have to do the same, and so on. Also, if you are making cheese, you have hair that always drops into the floor, and you can see it. You have to use hair nets, okay, to make cheese. That's why you, when when, you, when when we make when you sometimes when when I make videos, you see me because I'm making cheese, and I just take advantage of the time and make a video. But I'm always have my cheese net, my my hair net, to avoid hair from falling down. You have to do this all these steps. This this step should be in your in your system, should be in your protocol, okay? Um, if any of your raw milk cheeses fell within 24 hours, you have to check it out. You have to check it out what happened, okay? And once you know that your process works, you should verify it every month. Uh, now that you that you show that, you, that your process is working, okay. Every month you have to do the same. You have to make the lab test of your product to see what happened. So you are in this way you can prove that your system is working, and um, you have to keep records of everything. Okay. And another thing that you have to consider when you make the cheese, when you make cheese, is when you receive the raw material, when you receive your milk, when you receive your salt. When you receive your lactic cultures, when you receive your uh, even your equipment, molds, everything, they need to be. For example, if you're receiving your cheese gas, they can be ripped off. They need to be clean. And if you have your cloth that is ripped off, and some lining is going out, you have to really you have to discard it and dump it into the trash. Okay, you can. And that's the, sometimes we use. And disposal cheesecloth. We use it once, twice, and boom, dump it. Because in this way, we are guaranteeing that our product is not um, that the the cheesecloth is not contaminated. It's not, not it's not cross contaminated. It's not rip off, and, and these things are or or this strange foreign foreign bodies um, objects are gonna go into the into the court. Remember. Everything that goes into the court, people will eat it. So you have to, we have to be careful with it. Okay. Um, you have to check that your ingredients are in good condition, that they come at the right temperature. For example, if you receive your lactic culture, they need to be frozen. But we understand that the, um, these products even though they need to be frozen when they travel, they're not going to be uh, in uh, on cold. They're not going to be on the, under the cold. They're going to be, the, normally the supplies send it by post. So the culture is going to be exposed for a while, one week, two weeks, three weeks, let's, let's say one month without cooling, okay? It's not the end of the world. The, maybe the lactic culture will last a little bit less, but it will not die. So once you receive it, 
boom, put it in the fridge, in the, in the freezer, sorry, put it in the freezer at minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius. And in this way, you're guaranteeing that. If your milk is coming to your factory or to your kitchen from the supermarket, you have to see, you have to check that your milk is below four degrees. If it is not below four degrees, but it's, it's packed and, and, the, and the package is closed, okay, there is less um, probability that the, that the milk will be contaminated, but um, it will be because in the, in, in the, or it might be because in the um, container, even though it is close hermetically, you have oxygen and the bacteria, when the milk get hot, might reproduce because I have a bit amount of oxygen. So you have to uh, be careful with that. And the best thing is to guarantee that your milk comes at four degrees or less. If it comes, of course, not as not not frozen, but it has to be between one and four degrees, max eight degrees, max. If it is within this range, okay, you're you're okay. If your milk comes after eight degrees, you have to make a report and uh, write down my milk came at eight degrees. If something goes wrong with this milk, or and, and you, if you have a complaint from your clients. You have to tell your supplier the problem was the milk because it came it came too hot. But you have to, that that's the reason you have to make a record because if you make the record, you know what's what's happening. Okay, um, you need a system to keep track of the food as I said. Okay, and all the entries that you receive. If you're receiving salt, you have to write down in a in a in a in a table or in a form. You have to um, supplier the date, the amount, the um, the expiry date, the the number of batch, everything. The more information you have, the better is for your system. Okay. The idea is to be able to trace your product if you have a complaint. If you have a, a complaint, they call it in the in the industry they call it a recall. Okay. And then you have to, if you have a recall. That's a com or a compliant from your client or from your family. You need to know who you call. Uh, you, uh, you will you will be able to trace your product backwards, and you will have you will be able to trace your your product. Okay, and 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 call your clients or your family. Okay, um. It says here as well, you need to control the temperature of the milk that arrive. I in my um, in so generally in summer, the milk comes a little bit hot, but I have received milk at eight degrees, but no more than that. If the milk comes after eight degrees, boom, you have to reject it. Okay, and tell your supplier, hey, I can I can use this milk because it's too hot, and the supplier will take the um, preventive actions to give you the milk a little bit cool, cooler. So um, maybe early in the morning at six o'clock. I received my milk at six o'clock. So in this, when I made the cheese, I wake up at five, four o'clock in the morning, start sanitizing, I mean, following the pro my system. And after that, when the milk arrive, I start making the cheese, okay? In this way, we guarantee that our system is followed by the steps okay that we are that we have designed it okay and next week this is what i wanted to tell you about the food safety related to cheese making and um, next week i'm going to speak of about the international uh, competitions there are two competitions ongoing one is in the UK and the other one is in Spain. It's gonna be in Spain. One is for the International Cheese Award, the other one is for, for the World Cheese Award. But I'm gonna tell you which organizations are the best to compete. Um, but we'll talk about it. Um, I invite you to, to compete if you want to make the difference. If you are in and dependent of the country that you are, you have more or less requirements. Um, because for example, in third world countries, it's 
the this organization a little bit tougher because the cheese uh, the cheeses produced over there sometimes are not made from pasteurized milk and, and they're made with raw milk and they are fresh cheeses which doesn't com they don't comply with the standards international standards so um this company and this awards um put more or less um obstacles for the registration than others than uh, for and uh, than other countries so um but it's, we'll talk about it next week okay it's a very good um it's a short it's a short topic but it's a very beautiful because um it's when you make your cheese and someone tries and then it gives you a medal maybe a gold medal or a bronze medal or, or a silver medal okay so um and these awards are international awards are worldwide awards and you have one i have two and but my teacher has i reckon 100 and something okay um 132 i reckon does it he has my mentor uh, neil willman so um but of course he's been making cheese all his life and the idea is that you guys do the same and, and even though I have only two awards, I will I always compete. I'm going to compete in the International Cheese Award, and, and that is, is, is in October or November. And then the idea is to get awards. If you get it, get it. If you don't get it, okay, it's right. It doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world. Okay, now let's go with the questions. Ah, sorry. And um, before we finish, um, I'm going to speak. Um, remember that we have our webinar to make cheese in the 12th of September. At 10 a.m., okay, and we're gonna make a cheese called Palmita. And if you want to buy my gear, this is the, the merchandise that we do, okay, to support the channel. I have mine here. Life without cheese is like a love without a kiss. So, and let's go with the Q and A. Okay, let me finish here, and then we'll go with the Q and A. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go with the. I have some. I have a lot of questions from my audience. I have here um, some are in Spanish, some are in English. Mostly they're in English. Okay, <clears throat> but I'm gonna start um, translating the, the 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 Spanish ones. Hi, cheese doctor. Can I make cheese with coconut milk? Yes. You can make cheese with coconut milk. The thing is that when we when you make cheese with coconut milk, <coughs> the process is different because when we make cheese with raw, with cow milk or any animal milk with yeah with animal milk, the cheese the milk has proteins proteins that come from and from the animal. This protein this protein is mostly casein. Okay, when we make and these are animal proteins. When we make cheese from vegetable milk, like coconut coconut milk, um, if we use the in the the enzyme, even though it's um, a vegetable enzyme, which is the rennet vegetable rennet, if we use it to make to curdle the milk to coagulate the milk, it's not going to work. So we have to use another type of coagulant. For coconut milk, we use gelatin without flavor we can use um acid we can use any type of acid uh, no sorry not acid we can use gelatin we can use agar 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 i'm thinking about cheese making and you can use agar you can use pecti pectin or pectin you can use um cornstarch you can use tapioca any coagulant that, um, that uh, this this coagulant that I already named, name, you can use them to make this type of cheeses. Okay, um, I made a cheese, a vegan cheese, and I used tapioca. No, I, sorry, I used cornstarch, and it was alright. The more cornstarch that you use, the harder it's gonna be the cheese. 
And then you have to press it, you have to hit them up, you have to follow a, protocol, a procedure. If you want to know how to do, how to do it with, co with uh, coconut milk, go to my um, vegan cheddar video. It's the same process, the thing that I use almond milk, but it's the same process because it's a vegetable. So I use cornstarch, I, I give you the recipe, and I make cheddar. So um, you can go over there. Not, not hard cheddar, soft cheddar, like cheese whiz. The cheese whiz from Kraft, this, this brand, very good cheddar. It was really good. Graciela here, hi doctor. Why my aged cheeses and fresh ones, when I take them out of the fridge, they release too much whey when I cut them. Well, look, when we are making this type of cheeses, there's a process that I've said before called synergesis. The synergesis is a process when the cheese expel whey. Do, and the, and, the, and the, um, the factors that affect synergesis is one, temperature, the first one, and also movement. But it, because the cheese is already made and it's already molded, you don't have this factor. You only have temperature. And the temperature, when it gets hotter, the cheese naturally starts to release weight because you haven't, um, you haven't uh, allowed the cheese to drain properly during the, the, the cheese making process. So what you have to do is, um, before um, when you mold the cheese, you have to allow the cheese to drain away. So in this way, it doesn't happen. But the the the, the bad the bad news about allowing the cheese to release the way that is that it's going to wait less. So if you're doing cheese, if you if you're making cheese for as a business, your cheese is gonna wait less than expected, and you're gonna have of course. A, a, a lesser revenue so um you have to manage that okay um some cheese makers do what they do is they just mold the cheese after one hour two hours max boom they put it in the in the fridge so in this way they stop the synergies and the problem is going to be for the consumer because the cheese when they when the cheese get the, the right temperature as well, the environment, the, 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 the temperature from the environment, which is it's gonna be lower than the cheese. The cheese naturally, it's a natural process, it will release the weight. And because of that, it will he will lose weight and he, he he will lose weight and weight and money as well. Okay? It's a natural process. For for in in age cheeses, it shouldn't happen. If you dry your cheese accordingly, you shouldn't have this, this synergy process. The cheese shouldn't sweat. Sometimes they do, sometimes they do, but it's not the end of the world. Um, when, especially when you when you start aging your cheese and putting it in the in the in the fridge at minus four, uh, um, four three degrees or five degrees. And they and they shouldn't sweat, but sometimes they do. But it's not the end of the world. It, especially if you vacuum pack the cheese or wax it, the cheese won't be affected because um, there's no oxygen inside. Okay, especially if you vacuum pack it, and because there is no oxygen, there is no reaction inside the cheese. I when I was studying, I remember that I ate a half and a half. Told this story um, several times. I try a pecorino romano cheese that had eight years dry, uh, aging in the in the in the in the fridge, and it was floating away. I thought it was very disgusting, but when I when we tried the cheese was beautiful. Okay, I have it in my in my channel. Go go over there and pecorino tasting something like that in in my the video is in English. Okay, Jose Villarreal, he asked me, Hi, Dr. Cuesero. I made fresh cheese using vinegar, and I put too much vinegar, and my cheese tastes like it. What should I do? Well, very easy, Jose. You can 
wash the cord. How to wash it? Just um, when you make the cheese, when you when before salting, drain the whey until the cord level, and then put fresh water. Re, um, stir. The idea is to stir the, the, the curd into the fresh water to release the whey. To release because the, the, the cheese will start will, will carry on releasing whey. And it's acid, to acid. So wash it up. Let it set in on the bottom of the of the of the vat. Drain the whey again and repeat the process twice. It should be all right. If you notice that your cheese is still with the vinegar flavor, do it one more time and then it will disappear. Okay. Let me see if we have questions here. Manal. I Manal Manal. Okay, you didn't come last week, Manal, I reckon. Never mind. You always welcome to my show. Uh, hi, I asked you the last week, but I can't understand what you meant. Well, when I make queso fresco, I measured the pH curve coding and found 5.9 which is all right, okay, 5.9. How can avoid the faster acidity of the curd? Okay, that's a very good question. Look, Manal, when you make cheese, you are getting, a, a, when you measure the pH, before you measure the pH, remember, you have to calibrate your, thermo, your, your pH meter. First variable that you have to comply with. Calibrate your, your pH meter every time that you make cheese, okay? Every day. Once a day is more than enough, okay? Before you use it, calibrate it. And then carry on with the process. If you want to turn it off, doesn't matter. Turn it off and then you turn it on again. The, the, the pH is being calibrated, so it's no problem, okay? Okay, now you are, when you are making your cheese, when you, uh, put the uh, when you heat your milk, put the bacteria, and you have you let it, you let it ripen for one hour to allow the bacteria to awake. Okay. After coagulating your milk, the bacteria is already awoken and they will start feeding from the lactose. Okay. When they start feeding from the lactose, they will start acidifying. After the the hour, remember you ripen your 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 milk for one hour. To awake the bacteria after the hour you're going to coagulate with the rennet but the bacteria in during the coagulation the bacteria is still alive and the bacteria will produce because they when because they are alive and they are awoken they're going to start feeding from the lactose the, the more bacteria that you put the faster will be this acidification process, this acidification process. If you have too much bacteria, the speed of acidification will be faster. So if you are, when you are measuring your, when, at, at cutting, you shouldn't have this 5.9. When you cut your milk, when you cut your, your, your curd, you should have 6.4, 6.3, more or less. Okay, if you are having 5.9, is the reason is because you are putting too much bacteria. So you have to reduce the amount of culture that you are using. If you're putting, to put an example, if you're putting, uh, the, how many liters are you making? Maybe, let's say that you are making 30 liters. Okay, let's, let's put a number. If you are making 30 liters and you are putting one gram of bacteria and you are having at cutting you are having five you are having 5.9 of ph you know that your value is ac accurate because you calibrate your thermometer okay you're having 5.9 at, at molding you will reach easy 5.5 5 point or maybe five it will depend because um and this is going to be too acid for this moment. So you have to reduce the speed of, of acidification. You can do it in two ways. 
The first way is how I told you, reduce the amount of lactic culture that you're gonna put into your milk. If you're using, to put an example, half a gram for 30 liters, reduce the amount and put, instead of half a gram, put 0.25 grams, half of it, okay? And repeat the process in your next batch, in your next, in your next batch. If the, the, the rate of acidification should lower, should we should uh, slower down, okay? But let's say that you have to recover this this. Um, okay, this is the first the first part. Okay, reduce the 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 amount of lactic culture, and then you will your speed of acidification will be reduced as well. But let's say that you are having this problem, and you have to solve the situation. So you have 5.9, but before you reach 5.9, before you reach 5.9, my grandson is here. Let me, hi Joaquin. I, wait. Joaquin, 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 Joaquin. Joaquin. <laughs> My grandson is going to let's say hello. Say hello and say goodbye. Come on. Okay, say hello. Okay, here. Look at that. Look at that over there. Look at that here. The camera, the camera. Okay. Say hello and say goodbye. Okay. Okay. Now, now. The other the other way is that you already have the problem and your milk is and your curd is already acidified. But before you reach 5.9, don't wait too long. When you are Coagulating your milk, you have to measure your pH should be maybe six. Go go to the movie. Okay, go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that. Close the door, please. Okay. Before you reach in this this um 5.9 and you are realizing that your acidification speed is too fast, you have to slow it down. How do you slow it down this the rate of acidification? Because you're noticing that it's going too fast, what you have, what you, you have to do is take out take out fifty percent of the way. To put an example, take the way out, take fifty percent of your way, and um, put fresh water. In this way, you are taking out lactose from your vat, which means the bacteria will have less food, okay? The bacteria will have less food and therefore the amount of bacteria that is there, you're taking 50% of the bacteria out, you are dumping it and you only have, you, you will only have 50% of the remaining bacteria that you have into the vat. By putting fresh water, this 50% that is of bacteria that, that remains on the vat will only have this 50% we will, will not have enough food to, to acidify the milk. And because you're putting fresh water, you are just raising the level, the bacteria will have less food to feed and therefore the, the rate of acidification slower, will slower down as well. Okay. In this way, you can slower down the rate of acidification. This is how you do it. Okay. I hope you, I hope you understood. It says here, but if I still, still, I don't know what you mean by still. Uh, if I still don't cut the cord, I can't wash. No, you have to wash the cord. You have to cut your cord. You have to cut your cord. Cut it, okay, and then wash it. And you won't have any problem, okay? Because you already wait one hour. When you wait one hour, um, your cord is already coagulated. It's cordial. So after the hour, cut it. Do the cutting, and then if you notice that your rate is too 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 low, um, first you just cut. Okay, make it um, steer it slowly. Because if you if you if you steer too fast, you're gonna have too much fine, and it will be released during, during the draining process. So be careful. 
and be careful be careful you have to have a decent curve so you can manipulate it as i said two ways first one reduce the amount of culture in your next batch second reduce the amount of weight after cutting take 50 percent off of the of the of the way and replace it by the other 50 50 percent with fresh water in this way your bacteria will have less lactose and therefore the rate of acidification will slow it down for sure okay it says here can i ripen can I decrease the ripening time for milk when I'm putting the culture to avoid faster acidity? No, 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 no. The ripening time, the ripening time is to allow the bacteria to wake up. That's it. Okay? When you are ripening your milk, is to allow the bacteria to wake up. It's not that the bacteria, when you put the lactic culture, the bacteria will not start feeding from the lactose. No, the bacteria, because you are heating the milk and you're creating the right environment for the bacteria to awake. When the bacteria awakes, this time is one hour. You have to have one hour to allow the bacteria to awake. And when you are coagulating the milk, is that this is the time when the bacteria start um, to start feeding from the lactose and start acidifying the curd, not the milk. Okay? You have to allow only one hour. After one hour, boom, coagulate. After, during the coagulation process, the bacteria is still awoke, is still sleepy, and the, she's going to start feeding from the lactose, but slowly, not fast at the beginning. But if you have too much bacteria, because you put too much lactic culture, they, um, even though they're sleepy, because there is too much, the, the, the rate of, acidific of acidification will be uh, fast. So you have to decrease the amount of bacteria that you're putting into the milk. Okay? This is how you do it. I hope I explained myself. And this time you, can, you could understand me. Okay, let's go. G, 58 minutes. Time is over. And I only responded Manal's question. G, well, the show was for you, Manal. No se matter. I'm very happy. Okay, let's go with one, two more questions here. Vitaufas, Vitautas Semashkas. What is the easy way to make ice cream? Well, the easy way to make ice cream without this is using a cheese um, ice making machine. It's very easy. You just, you just the mix, put into the machine, and put the ice. Remember to put ice with salt because the salt will preserve the, the, the ice and then turn the machine. Boom. If you don't have a machine, if you don't have an ice making machine, you can use the same mixture, okay, which is more or less milk, van uh, vanilla sugar and some cream you put some cream whipped cream or something like that i don't remember what type of cream but it's a cream to increase the fat level you have to increase the fat level so um and then if you don't have the the, the ice making machine you can put it into the fridge leave it for maybe one hour when it starts getting hard just take it out and stir it for maybe one or two minutes to allow the 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 because the cheese the, sorry the ice cream will start to get frozen on the outside of the container. So you have to take it out from the outside and move it to the inside. So the inside can go to the outside to get frozen again. It, by doing that, this is the same process that we do when that the machine does when they when they when she makes the the, 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 the the ice cream. Okay. And another one. Um Kaylee Kaderli, hi, cheese doctor. Can you please explain more about coliforms infection in cheese? Ah, this is very important. This is a very good one. Look, coliform. I'm gonna give you a rough because we are out of time. Maybe if you come next week, um, 
well, the thing is that um, these are questions from, from my answer, from my audience. But how to avoid coliforms? Coliforms is a bacteria that are from the um, droppings of the cattle. Okay. When we are milking our, especially if we use fresh milk, if we're using raw milk, when we are making cheese with raw milk, we for sure are going to have coliform, for sure. Why? Because when the cows are into the farm and they go to, into the into the place that when they get milk, some of them, especially if the if the milkers are done, if, if the milking is done, is done by by hand, it's done by manually. So the idea, the thing is that they are the 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 labor that does it. They milk it. Maybe the the over the over of the over of the of the cow have droppings, the rest of droppings, because the um, the, the milk the, the the cows make the droppings and it splashes the over the over if the labor doesn't wash it accordingly. There's gonna be rest of droppings into the uh, on the on the over, and then by ha handling, it will get contaminated. And because he the generally the labor doesn't wash the hands, and with the same hands they just milk the other cow, and so on, you will have contamination over there. Okay. Also, if we uh, when they when when when. The farmers are milking the cows. Sometimes the cows, during the process, they drop their stuff. Okay, this stuff um, splash the over, or it stays in the, in, the, in the best case scenario. It doesn't splash the over, but it stays on the on the floor, and the flies come, drop, and um, they just stop on the on the droppings. And they fly and go to the milk, to the tank. And if the tank is not covered, or if the tank is, or to the to the container that contains the milk, because sometimes they, if they actually they do it by hand, they just pour the bucket into the containers and they use like a strainer or something like that, or a cheesecloth, and the flies stop on the cheesecloth and because they already stop in the um, on the droppings, they're going to cross contaminate the milk as well. So this is how it happens. And the coliforms, what they do is, um, they produce gas in the in the um, in the cheese because the cheese is not is not safe. So the coliforms reproduce into the into the curd. When, when we when we make the cheese, we finish the cheese, but the coliflower is in there, and then the coliflower will start uh, reproducing inside the cheese, and it will produce gas. What type of gas does he produce? He produces hydrogen, not CO2. He produces hydrogen, and you can notice that the cheese is being inf infected by coliflower when the holes of the cheese are very small and uh, a lot of them. This is the typical cross contamination of coliforms when they when your cheese has a lot of holes, very small ones, and heaps of them. Co um, holes made by propionin bacterium bacteria um, are big ones, and not so many. Okay, this is the cheese. This is how the the the, the cheeses that are when we use propionin bacterium. Uh, bacteria. So the the very the typical cross contamination of um, of coliform is small holes and a lot of them. Okay, how to avoid them? How to avoid coliform? Pasteurizing the milk. End of the story. By pasteurizing the milk, you kill the coliform. Okay, so my advice always pasteurize your milk. Don't you, especially if you do if you're making fresh cheeses. If you're making ripened cheeses, don't worry about it. Okay, but you have to. Um, but if you have too much, 
attack of coliform, you might have a problem even if even though you're using raw milk uh, or even though you're you you're aging your cheeses so but the international standard states that you have to age your cheeses for more than two months if you and i said and i said it in the presentation if you are using raw milk so in the but but posturizing you get all you for you get you have peace of mind you can forget about these problems because you pasteurize and everything i always pasteurize my milk and sometimes if i don't pasteurize i buy pasteurized milk which is easier when i make my cheeses i usually pasteurize my raw milk but then i realized that i wasted too much time because my equipment is small so uh, i prefer to buy the milk pasteurized already pasteurized and i can save a lot of time okay but if you if you are using for example a cheese vat with 1000 liters it's better to buy raw milk and pasteurize it because you're pasteurizing 1000 liters in one shot which is right it will save you money it will it will and and you will cheese will be safe okay okay and uh, i reckon that's all um manal yeah thanks good vibes <laughs> thank you manal thanks for coming thank you doctor i'm very appreciative for you uh, don't worry um i'm really spread the voice that i'm here uh, with your friends with your family if they want to make how to uh, how to if you want to learn how to make cheese remember that i'm be i'm here every week at 11 30. okay and um, people uh, only for english speakers and um, if, if you want to learn how to make the palmisulia cheese go for it register and i will be really special with you as always okay and um, thanks for coming and see you next week as i said next week hey i don't know what we're gonna i ah, know next week we're gonna speak about the um, international cheese competitions and well i mean uh, as i said as i always finish my programs and my shows and um, see you next week and eat cheese because life without cheese is like a love here without a kiss so, um, see you next week and be safe.